So back on target here, though. So this morning, we are continuing our series in Revelation. And uh, I, I just can't even tell you how proud I am of all of you as your pastor. Everyone that has talked to me in the last week has said Revelation, and it just <laughs> swells my heart. <laughs> uh, I, we have an enormous, uh, enormous amount of material uh, to cover this morning. Um, some might say an unwise uh, amount of material. Um, but, but I really hope that as we do this uh, this morning, that um, uh, some, some messages maybe that you've heard or some, you know, some things that I've written to really get down into the weeds on, on each one of these items. And there's a place for that. Like, I'm, I'm for that. You know, it, it's possible that the Lord may set it up such that we'll come back to these seven churches specifically as a part of their own sermon series someday. Today, we're going to just kind of jump across the mountaintops of it. But I, but I think that as we do that, it's going to help us kind of see the big picture and, and take some stuff in that I, I really believe is going to be helpful uh, and challenging to us uh, as we do that. Um, <clears throat> so today is the church age. Uh, the message this morning, I've called it the church age, slightly more exciting of a title than, <laughs> than last Sunday, part A introduction. But I want to say this um, before we get started, because, because we are going to be mostly covering the major themes of Revelation throughout this series, um, I recognize that many people have specific questions um, about this. And if that's you, uh, what, what I've done is I've made these little cards, um, these little question cards, and they are available. There are some uh, in the back by the offering box. There are some at the welcome desk. If you have a specific question, there's something in your own study of Revelation that has bugged you or that you're curious about, that you've not understood, uh, and you'd like me to take a whack at it, uh, write, write your question down. The teens have been doing this, and it's been really wonderful. I've already got some questions from the teens from last Sunday. Um, but if any of you, it occurred to me that sometimes adults have questions too. So listen, if that's you, if you want to write it down, um, either I'll try to make sure that I address it in an upcoming sermon, or if it's a really technical question, I might just email you back. If you give me your email address, I might just email and respond directly to try to answer your question. We're also uh, sort of tentatively planning um, what we're going to call the lightning round. Uh, we're going to probably do one on a Wednesday night and maybe one on a Sunday morning where I'll just take a stack of these. Depends on how many we get. We'll take a stack of these and just try to answer a bunch of questions that people have. So just be aware those are available uh, if you would like. Okay. This morning, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Uh, if you still got your Bibles open to Revelation chapter 2, would you look there with me again? You already stood for the reading of it, so I won't ask you to stand again, but do look with me if you would at Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. I want to read just the first part of these verses, and then we'll pray. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Now, that's odd already that it's addressed to the angel of the church of Ephesus. We're coming back to that. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And we're going to explain that in a moment also. And then verse 2, here's, here's the message to the angel of the church of Ephesus from the one with the seven golden stars in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Here's what he says, verse 2, I know thy works. I know thy works. All right, let's pray together. God, we just thank you again for this time that we have together. Lord, we ask for these next few moments, Father, that <clears throat> God, that you would just speak clearly. Thank you for giving us your word. God, you, you know that it is, is my earnest desire to try to do a good job explaining this. But I'm in such desperate need of your help. Lord, these are your people. And they've come to hear from you. And I, I really don't want to mess that up. So please help me. Lord, we pray that you'd help all of us. God, that we, you'd give us ready minds, that we, we would have soft hearts, that we might be able to take in whatever it is that you want to say to us, that we'd, that we'd get it. And Lord, not that we would just learn things this morning, but that these things that we learn about you and about what you've said, God, that it would change us, that it would work itself out practically in our lives. The world needs light. It's, 
getting so dark. Lord, you're that light. We pray that you'd shine brightly in us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as we look at Revelation chapter 2, um, I'm going to cover a, a bunch of material, as I said this morning. And so hopefully you've got a, a bulletin on the way in this morning. You'll notice there's a lot of blanks. There's even icons and stuff in there. Maybe you think that's cool. That's actually a bad sign. That means that I am nervous about how much I'm trying to cover. And so I'm doing everything I can to try to make this followable. Uh, if I lose you this morning, I'm super sorry. It's probably not your fault. Um, but <clears throat> as we look at this, we try to understand the first question. We'll fill some of those blanks in and the bulletins as we go along. If you'd like to do that, of course, you can just listen. But the first thing that we want to answer this question about, okay, what are these seven stars and what are these seven golden candlesticks? And who is this that's standing in the midst of them? If you were here last Sunday, you know that this is the risen Jesus Christ. And he is spectacular. It is an incredible thing to see um, Jesus, not with his glory no longer veiled in the humility of his first coming, but just he is, he is, he will knock you down on your face. Spectacular now. And when he speaks, the Bible says it's like the sound of many waters and like the sound of a trumpet blowing. And so you have to imagine that when, when Jesus here says, I know thy works, that it sounds like a waterfall and it sounds like trumpets. I mean, this is this is a deal here that's happening, right? But he's got seven stars in his right hand, the Bible says, and he's walking in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. And this is the vision that John is seeing of him. You say, well, what are those? And the good news is you don't really have to wonder. If we back up one verse into chapter 1, verse 20, I, I told you last week that chapter 1, verse 20 really is the start of chapter 2. I don't know why that chapter division is the way it is. But look with me, if you would, at Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. Just back up one verse. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. Here's the answer. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the, the seven candlesticks are seven churches. And those stars that Christ is holding in his right hand are the angels that are assigned to each one of those churches. Now, there's a couple of interesting observations we can make from this. Uh, I could preach an entire sermon on this. I'm tempted to, but I will try to restrain myself. Uh, but I want to make two kind of observations uh, about this. And the first one has to do with the angels. Um, the Bible does not give us very much information about angels. We know a little bit, <clears throat> um, and it's, it's actually, I, I would just like to give you a warning. It's a little dangerous to try to get information about spiritual matters that the Bible does not give us, because if it's a spiritual matter and the Bible doesn't give us the information, what sources are available for spiritual information? Potentially demonic sources. I'll, I'll remind you that the devil is real, that the fallen angels are real. They are spiritual beings. So we should be very, very careful with spiritual sources that are not the Bible. Okay? So I don't have, as we go through Revelation, we're going to see angels crop up a whole bunch. And you, you might say, tell me more about angels. There's not a lot to say. We know that they're super powerful beings. They're enormously powerful. Uh, it took one angel one night to wipe out every firstborn in the land of Egypt. They, they are incredibly powerful beings. And, and when you think about that, and like the good ones, praise God, are on our side, on the Lord's side. So when the Bible says things like in uh, Psalm 91, 11, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. All right, maybe you've heard of this idea of guardian angels. That's, that's a basically biblical idea that God will use his angels to help take care of us. Isn't that a wonderful thing? But here specifically, we see that God has an angel assigned to each church. Each individual church has its own angel. And I'll tell you this morning, I believe that Spokane Baptist Church has an angel that's watching out for us. Isn't that, now that doesn't mean nothing terrible is ever going to happen. Terrible things happen in churches all the time. But it's not because God isn't paying attention. It's not because he hasn't done work 
to watch out for his church. And that's really a kind of a cool thought. How the details of that work, I just genuinely do not know. The second thing I want to say about this is about the candlesticks. Um, the candlestick does not generate any light. Some of you just realize why it's so dark in your house. <laughs> you can't just put the candlestick out and have light. The candlestick holds up the light, right? It gets into a position where instead of the light just kind of pooling somewhere inconvenient, you get it up a little bit higher, the light can spread further. Everybody understand? That's okay, physics, praise God. So when, when the church is pictured as the candlestick, it's a reminder of what the purpose of the church is. The purpose of the church is to hold up the light. It's to hold up the gospel and Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen to that. It's also going to be significant as we go through this, that, the, that one of the things that Jesus is going to say to one of these churches is, if they don't repent, if they don't fix the, the trajectory, that they're on a bad course, they're going the wrong direction. And Jesus says, if you keep going the wrong direction, I'm going to come and I'm going to take away your candlestick. What's that mean? It means that they're going to not be a church anymore. Instead, they're going to be a club. There's going to be, they're going to be a social organization. How many of you know there are still places in America and Europe and around the world that are called churches, but they have no candlestick? The gospel is departed. There, there's no preaching of Jesus Christ anymore. They still meet there. Maybe they meet there on Sundays. Maybe they're doing stuff. There might be activities and a schedule and a calendar and stuff and things. But if there's no gospel, it's not a church. It might even be a group of nice people, but it's not a church. The church is the candlestick and it holds up the light. And as we're going to see, churches can have severe problems and Jesus still considers them a church. They, if there's some gospel light there, it counts. But the goal is not just to have a minimum, it's to have the maximum. Somebody say amen. Okay, so let's look at these seven churches this morning. As I said, we're going to do this um, pretty quickly. For the first one, the first church that Jesus addresses here, as we just read a moment ago, is Ephesus. And so I'm calling Ephesus the hard-working church. Okay, this is, this is I, like, I like the church at Ephesus. It's a hard-working church. And so we're going to look at them. Now, we're going to look at every single one of these seven verses about Ephesus. When we get to the next six churches, we're going to move a little more quickly. Okay, so nobody panic. All right. So Ephesus, let's look at what it says here uh, about Ephesus. Verse number two. So here's Jesus in the midst of the candlesticks speaking to this one specifically, to this church. Now, the Ephesian church, let me say also, was a real church. Ephesus is a real city. It's in Asia Minor. It's what today we would call Turkey. You can go visit it today. The ruins even of this church, you can go visit it. Unfortunately, as we'll see, not much left there today. Um, there are Christians there, praise God, but um, there's a real church that Jesus is addressing. Okay. He says in verse two, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. You, you can't bear them that are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And thou hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Now you'll notice as we read that, that what the Lord is doing here, what Jesus, when he looks at this church at Ephesus, he's highlighting some of their strengths. He's saying, when I look at your church, Ephesians, I see some really good things. And if, and if you noticed, a lot of those things had to do with how hard they're working. He says, I've seen your work. I've noticed your labor. I can see how patiently you continue to work. And over and over, in just these couple of lines, this theme of hard work comes out. And so we see that this is a hardworking church. It's a patient church. Jesus also mentions their rejection of evil, that they're not fooled by the evil preachers, that they're not fooled by the people that are claiming to be apostles. They're claiming to speak for God, but they're not. He says, you've tried them. You can sort out the wheat from the chaff, the good from the bad. Good job, Ephesian church. You're sticking to it. Good job. But then the Lord's going to say, but, but everything is not well at Ephesus. Everything's not well. They have a failure that the Lord's going to point out to them. There, there's a way in which they're coming short, and it's this. that They've lost 
their first love. They've lost their first love. Look at verse 4. He says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. I don't know if you know this. Um, this is certainly true in my life. Uh, I, I find this letter to the Ephesians to be personally very convicting because sometimes it's easy to just get after it. In ministry, in following Christ, and, and sometimes you can be as like, man, I am doing my Bible study, and I got my prayer time, and I got my study time, and I'm doing this ministry, I'm involved in that ministry, and I'm writing letters to these people, and I'm praying for those people, and I'm counseling these people, and we're doing this, and we're doing that, and we're making it happen, and taking care of my wife, and taking care of my kids, and I got date nights on the schedule, and playtime with, with the kids is on the schedule, and I've got it worked out, and now I'm execute, execute, execute. That's a little terrible window into the psyche of your pastor right there. <laughs> but Jesus says, I see how hard you're working and that you are against evil and you're trying to figure out what's true and you're getting after it. But I want you to know, don't lose your love, your love for me. And he has this instruction to this church. He says, I have some instruction for you. And this is how the instruction goes. He says, I want you to remember I want you to repent, and I want you to return to the basics. Look at what it says in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. He says, remember what it was like when you first heard the gospel. When you first heard about Jesus. When you first learned that he loved you, a sinner, broken, hopeless. He loved you enough to die on an old rugged cross for you. Do you remember when you first heard that? Do you remember how you felt when you realized that Jesus would take you just as you are? Do you remember what it was like when Jesus said, you give me your sin and your wickedness and your selfishness and your greed and your pride. You give that to me and I'll bear it to Calvary. And in exchange, I'll give you a white robe and I'll give you my name and I'll give you righteousness and I'll make you a home in heaven. Do you remember what that felt like? He says, Ephesians, remember. And he says, repent. Repent to change your mind. Instead of just being so focused on the work, remember why. Remember why. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, the first things. I, I love all the ministry that happens in church. I love all the ministries I'm involved in personally. But I want to tell you, there's no substitute for personal time with God. It's fine to preach and teach Sunday school and be an usher and make food and do vacation Bible school and all the things. It's all good. But if you, if I, am not having just that one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord, that personal just relationship time with just me and just God, if you don't get to the basics, you're going to fall apart. And, I, and I've been on the verge of that a couple of times in my life where I was still busy, but it wasn't being motivated by just love anymore. It turns into just kind of duty, and that's dangerous. Jesus says, if you don't, if you don't get back to the basics, to just spending time with me in your Bible and spending time with me in prayer, singing songs to me, he says, if you don't do that, he says, I will come unto thee quickly and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He says, eventually you're not going to be in a church anymore. Christian, this happens to churches all the time. There are churches across America today that got so busy feeding the poor and caring for orphans and like, and rescuing people out of drugs. And thank God for that. Somebody say amen. amen. But now that's all they do. They feed hungry people. They take care of orphans. They rescue people out of drugs. That's awesome. But that's not the gospel. Yeah, that's right. And they've turned into social clubs that do good. But they're not churches. They're not holding up the light anymore. And there's a danger that you work so hard, you forget why. The goal is not that people will have full bellies until they die and go to hell. It, 
It's not that they'll be sober when they die and go to hell. What are we doing here? People need Jesus and they need him before they die. And I'm in favor of feeding hungry people and getting people clean and sober. And I'm in favor of taking care of the orphans and the widows. We, church, we're commanded to do those things. But why? So that we can tell them about Jesus. You got to remember your first love. And then he addresses the overcome. And we're going to see this in every single one of these churches. Jesus is going to say, here are the strengths, here are the failures, here's my instruction to you. And then Jesus is going to address the overcomer. And this is really powerful. If you'll get a hold of this, this is really powerful this morning. Because I want you to see every church has strengths and weaknesses. Every church is doing some things better, some things worse, room to improve. There's instruction for us to have. But whatever your church is like, Jesus wants you to be an overcomer. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is the way that Jesus deals with people as individuals. We live in an age, one of the great curses of our age, and I, I don't mean this to be political. It's going to sound political, but I don't mean it that way. We live in an age that increasingly puts emphasis on dividing people into groups. This group is afflicted. This group is the oppressors. This group is allowed to say this. This group, not allowed to say it. This group, we're going to treat like this. This group, you understand, you understand what I'm saying to you this morning? It is wild, wild dangerous to just start shoving people into groups and treating everybody in that group a certain way. I feel like somehow we learned nothing from what happened in the 20th century. That putting people in a group and saying everybody in that group is this way is a bad idea. It's a bad idea. And I want you to see that Jesus says, here's what I see in your church, but I want to talk to you, the individual now. To the overcomer. Your church may be strong or weak, but you don't get to blame your church for your life. You don't get to blame your church for your life. Jesus says, what are you doing? Look at what he says in verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So hear what Jesus says to the church. And then it switches. To him. Right? To the singular. To the individual now. To just you. To him that overcometh. Will I give to eat of the tree of life. Which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, what's that? What, that's heaven. Saying to the overcomer, it's heaven. Now, how many of you know that going to heaven is not based on works? Oh, I need a much bigger amen than that. Do, do, do you know that going to heaven is not based on your works? All right, I'll accept that. Uh, going to heaven is based on faith in Jesus Christ. So what's, what's here is not if you overcome, you get to go to heaven. What's here is like, it's a reminder, overcomer, that yes, you have obstacles. Yes, there are things that are not right in your life, in the world. Maybe things that aren't right in your church. But you stick with Jesus. You stick by the stuff. You go with Jesus, no matter what's happening in your church. You go with Jesus. And not only is heaven waiting for you, but this reminder, each one of these seven metaphors for heaven, pictures something specific about what the overcomer is overcoming. What's the problem in Ephesus? They're losing their first love. She says, okay, this Ephesian church, you're losing your first love. But you, individual in the Ephesian church, you, you keep your first love. You stay in love with Jesus. You stay in love with God. And if you'll do that, I want to remind you that in heaven, you're from the tree of life that's in the garden in heaven. That's looking back to what was the whole point? When God made us... The point was fellowship with God in the Garden of Eden. God made you to walk and talk with him in the garden in the cool of the evening to have face-to-face -face fellowship with God. That's what we lost in our sin and in the fall. And God says, when you get to heaven, 
That's what it's about again. It's about that fellowship with the Lord. So that's why it's highlighted for the overcomer at the Ephesian church is, listen, remember what it's for. Remember what it's about. So the overcomer will eat from the tree of life. Now, all Christians are going to eat from the tree of life. Somebody say amen. If you're saved, you're going to eat from the tree of life. But this is a specific encouragement to the one who is overcoming in a church that has lost some of its first love for Christ. Is hang on to that. In heaven, it's coming back. Make sense? Okay. Now we're going to start moving a little bit more quickly. The next church here in verse 8 is Smyrna. And Smyrna, we call the suffering church. I call <laughs> the suffering church. Look at verse 8 and 9 with me. Unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, <laughs> Don't Google this. You'll find all kinds of wild nonsense. Um, so, so some people, some people have to use these sorts of verses to make some kind of anti-Semitic remarks and stuff like that. I feel like those people have forgotten that Jesus was a Jew and that all the apostles are Jews. Somebody help me now. Okay. Um, the, all right. Deep breath. Here we go. Okay. What, who, who is this? Some people tried to say, the most common thing you'll find is people will say that these are people that are Jews that are not Christians. That doesn't make any sense. It's the same thing as like in Ephesians, they tried those that said they were apostles, but weren't. There turns out there are a group of people who will say that they're Jewish, that they're related to Abraham, but are not. And they're involved in some really terrible persecution of the church. And I think God takes a pretty dim view of people that are pretending that they're related to Abraham, but are not. Because guess what? You can't get righteousness by being related to Abraham anyway. So you've like missed it twice. Okay. But he says, I know thy works, thy tribulation, thy poverty, but that thou art rich. Verse 10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation 10 days, but be thou faithful unto death and I'll give thee a crown of life. So the strengths of this church is that they are enduring suffering that they are enduring poverty. You say, that doesn't sound like a strength, but here it is. Out of that suffering, out of that poverty, this is a spiritually rich church. Outwardly, it doesn't look good. Nobody says, I want to go to that church. But maybe you should, because this church is spiritually rich. Brothers and sisters, most, not most, but, but a great number of our brothers and sisters this morning belong to Smyrna kind of churches. Last night at a prayer meeting, we were praying for our brothers and sisters, specifically in Myanmar uh, and in Pakistan. Terrible riots going on in Pakistan right now. There's two Christian nurses that got accused of defacing a Koran. They're in prison and they're not, probably getting out anytime soon. But they, even if they did, the mobs are outside the prison wanting them dead. It's dangerous to be a Christian in Pakistan right now. In Myanmar, there's been a coup. Um, they've shut down the internet. Uh, I talked to Pastor Eldridge this week. They've been able to get two messages out of, out, of, out of Burma, out of the believers, all the churches they're in contact with them. They've had two messages in the past month. And both of them were a sentence long. They said, things are hard. Pray for us. The suffering church. They don't, they don't have nice buildings. It's dangerous to just show up to church. There are literally mobs in the streets outside chanting for the death of some of their fellow church members. But spiritually rich. That's what Jesus sees when he looks at this church. He, and it's interesting when, when it gets to the failures part. Now, you and I both know there's no such thing as a perfect church. And, and the Smyrna church, of course, wasn't perfect either. The point is that Jesus doesn't have any criticism for them. 
given the deep waters they're going through and the fact that they're persevering through it, Jesus says, I see what you're going through. When I look at you, you're rich. Keep going. Isn't that wonderful? Just the tenderness of the Lord when he talks to this, to this deeply suffering church. His instruction to them is simple. Remain faithful. Don't quit. And here it says 10 days. Uh, it seems likely that this church was going through something that prophetically here John says is going to last 10 days. We can understand that, I think in the literal sense, to Smyrna, but broadly to the church in general, the tribulation it ends. It goes on and then it stops. Hang in, don't quit. To the overcomer at Smyrna, Jesus says that I will give thee a crown of life. I think that is an identifying two things, the overcomer. Okay, you're in a church that's deeply, badly suffering, poor and afflicted. Don't quit. Now, I don't want the church to quit, but you as an individual, don't you quit either. And if you hang in there, I know you're poor now, but I'm going to give you a crown. And not only is it a crown, it's a crown of life. Because some of these Christians, many of them are going to die. They are going to be martyred for Christ. He says, but I'm going to give you a crown of life. Now, Christian, if you're saved, we're all going to get a crown of life. But that's especially exciting if you're an overcomer in the Smyrna church. The next church up, the third church, is Pergamos. The Pergamos church I call the worldly church. Pergamos is the worldly church. But even though they're worldly, they're not without any strengths. Jesus, when he looks at the Pergamos church, this worldly church, he, he has a couple things nice to say about him. And that is mostly that they're loyal to Christ. They're still loyal to him, and they refused to deny him. So this church is embracing the world. They're, they're going into the world. They're, they're leaving the pure following of Christ. The worldliness is coming in. But, but Jesus said, but, but you're still loyal to me. You're you haven't denied my name. You haven't denied Christ. And so he says, that's good. Good job. <laughs> the failures here are kind of a doozy. When he gets to the failures, it's toleration of heresy, idolatry, and immorality. Would you agree with me? Those are pretty epic sins to be having going on inside of a church. Yeah. That's pretty rough. Now, here's, now, now, now remember, this church still has a candlestick. Candlestick means it's church. You and I might look at it and go, I don't know if that's still a church. But, but Jesus decides what's a church and what's not. Right? Now, this is not like, this won't be politically correct either, but that's not what you came here for. <clears throat> not like the Mormons. Different Jesus. Do you understand that the Mormons have a different Jesus than the one that's in this Bible? They call him the same name, but, it's, but he's not the same. You look at the way that he's described his attributes, you will, if you compare their Jesus to the Jesus of the Bible, you will see it's a different Jesus. You, that's not, you're not a church anymore. Do you, under, do you understand? Right? Okay. But Jehovah's Witnesses. Jesus is a prophet to them. Jesus was not just a prophet. If you got Jesus as just a prophet, you got no way to get your sins paid for. You're in big heap trouble. It's not a church. So this, this is a church... But this church is on its way down the tubes. And we're going to see that as we go. Look at what it says in verse 14. We're still in chapter 2, verse 14. It says, I have a few things against thee, Pergamos, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. You say, who's Balaam? Balaam was a prophet. He's an Old Testament prophet. He was a prophet. But if you know about him, he was a prophet that would sell good reports to people. So they would pay him to tell them that God, what they wanted God to say. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Balaam is a bad dude, right? He's the guy that God had to use his donkey to talk to him because he was that out of line. That God had better luck with his donkey than he did with this prophet, <laughs> right? But Balaam, not only, not only like the, preach, the uh, preaching for hire, which y'all know where to put that in our today's context, Okay. But he also opened the door to immorality, to idolatry in the land of Israel. He, he condoned it. He said, no, that's okay. You can do that, which wasn't true. He says, 
And so Jesus here is looking at Pergamos, and he says, you have there in your church people that hold the doctrine of Balaam, that will tell the people what they want to hear for money, that will say, oh, that idolatry is okay. Oh, that immorality is okay. Do you know, church, that there are churches today where the pastors will get up, and in order to keep the people in, in order to keep the money coming in, will tell people what they want to hear? will tell them that things that the Bible says are wrong. There are pastors today who will tell people that that's okay. Churches today like that. Listen, Jesus loves everybody. Jesus wants everybody to get saved. But some things are wrong. They're sin. And if you do them, it will hurt and kill you. And if you say that sin is okay, you are condoning people hurting and killing themselves. And I want to say immorality, specifically sex morality, have you noticed how many churches today are saying things that the Bible says are sin are fine? Have you noticed that? This is dangerous stuff. The churches would say things that God says are sin are fine because they're not helping those sinners. They're hurting them. That's a whole other sermon too, but I want you to see that that's going on here at the Pergamos church. And Jesus' instruction to them is repent quickly. When you let heresy, when you let off doctrine, when you let this idolatry and immorality into the church, it's cancer, it spreads, and it will kill the church. Jesus says, cut it out and cut it out fast. Don't let it go any further. To the overcomer at Pergamos, he says, I'll give you the hidden manna and a new name. Maybe the Pergamos church, if, listen, if you're in a Pergamos church, and like, Lord willing, you here this morning or not. <laughs> but the instruction to those that are in a Pergamos church is that, hey, I know the church isn't doing a good job feeding you, but God will feed you. God will feed you with the hidden manna, the, with the bread from heaven. And you get a new name. All Christians, you're going to get a new name in heaven. That's going to be exciting. But I think it's especially encouraging to the overcomer at Pergamos. Your name's not going to be forever tarnished with that church that you were a part of. Isn't that good? Now, could I say this? If you're part of a Pergamos church, find a new one. Okay. You have options. Not everywhere in the world does. Do you understand that in America, we have an embarrassment of churches here? It's one of the reasons I'm burdened about missions and getting the gospel to places that, listen, there, there isn't a church. Or, there, there, or all, the only church in town is a Pergamos church, right? That, that, that's it. They don't have any other options. Now, here in Spokane, you, you have options. And, and listen, may I say this also? If this church ever turns into a Pergamos church, which will be over my dead body, but if that ever happens, find a new one. Okay. Now, it's still a church, wildly. It's got a candlestick. It's got an angel. Praise God, there's still some gospel in this church. But if you've got a choice, do better. All right. All right. Next up is the Thyatira church. This has actually gotten worse. We went from the worldly church at Pergamos now to the corrupted church at Thyatira. But it's not without, it's not dead yet. This corrupted church has a couple strengths. Its strengths are their love. They love God. And they love each other. That's pretty good. This church, one of their strengths is service. They're involved in serving others and serving the poor and taking care of the needy. It's a church that's involved in service. It's a church that has faith. There's still a lot of stuff that they believe. And interestingly, it says patient improvement. Jesus highlights their patient improvement. This church is it's very corrupted. It's super, super broken. We're going to see that in just a moment, how, how terribly broken this church is. But there are people in it that are trying to make it better. And it's slow going. They're not making much progress, but they're making little bits here and there. And Jesus says, I see you that are making some patient improvement in that church. I see it. Their failures, though, are toleration of paganism idolatry and immorality. Now, the difference here between the Pergamos church that tolerated heresy, heresy is wrong doctrine. Paganism is just, it's not, it's not just wrong, it's 
backwards and upside down. Y'all with me on that? Okay. So look at verse 20. Chapter 2, verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. She says to the church, you've got Jezebel calling herself a prophetess in your church. Now, <laughs> the, the Pergamos church had these Balaams in it. Jezebel is in power in this church. She's in a position of authority in this church, and she is teaching people to commit fornication and idolatry. I mean, this church is bonkers out of control. Now, I think there's, there's a real, there was a real woman here in, in the Thyatiran church that was doing this. I believe that was literally true. But, but this Jezebel is a picture. She's the Old Testament. She's the pagan wife of King Ahab. He was the king of Israel. He was supposed to be following God. But he married a pagan woman. And she came into Israel and she started building temples to Baal and to the pagan gods and the sacred groves and sacrificing their children in the fire. And all this awful wickedness came into the land of Israel and much of it at Jezebel's hand. And that's the picture here. The Pergamos church or the Thyatiran church has allowed this person to come in, to have authority in the church. And she's teaching not just iffy doctrine, but paganism. Verse 24, but I say unto you and the rest that are in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. In other words, not everybody in the church is caught up in this. And sometimes, listen, we can be quick to do that. We can look at a church like a Thyatiran church and go, burn it down. But Jesus makes that call. Not us. Because Jesus knows there's still some people inside and they're trying to make things better in there. They're patiently working at it. Now, you and me, I think, get out, <laughs> right? But some people are, for whatever reason, maybe it's their only option or whatever. They're stuck there. Okay. So the instruction is repent. Judgment is coming. For those that have not known the depths of Satan in there, hold fast. Now, you'll notice it goes repent quickly, right? To the Pergamos church, repent quickly the can before the cancer spreads. Here's a church that didn't repent quickly. Now the cancer has spread, and Jesus says, the judgment's coming. This church is living out its final chapter. The next generation, this will not be a church anymore. This is the last chapter of the Thyatiran church. It will not survive this. Jesus says, repent, here comes the axe. If you're in there, hold on what you have. Next, you don't think it can get worse, but it's your, oh, the overcomer. <laughs> Power over nations, given the morning star. I think the, the idea here is that power does not come from making deals with the pagans. Power comes from being loyal to Christ. The morning star is Jesus Christ, so you, the overcomer receives Christ. Okay. Next up, we have the Sardis church. The Sardis church. This is the powerless church. The powerless church. Look at chapter 3. Verse number one, or, or just listen, the powerless church. Under the church, under the angel of the church of Sardis, write these things, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Why does this church have a candlestick? I don't know. There's just enough of a spark left in this church. Here's what I think. It says, thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Here's what I think. This is what I think it means. This church is a body lying on the ground. And you might look up it and go, I don't know, it looks dead. Jebediah poke it with a stick. Right? But God looks at it and he says, not, there's a pulse still. Now it can't do anything. It's alive, but dead. Can't do anything anymore, but it's not quite dead yet. Turns out it's only mostly dead. A little princess bride for you. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's a powerless church. It's a powerless church. Um, what's, what's the strength of the powerless church? What's Jesus going to say? There's a few faithful left. 
the nicest thing Jesus can say about the Sardis church is there's a few faithful left. There's a few in there that are faithful to Jesus Christ. Its failure is obvious. It's spiritually dead. It's a dead church. It can't do anything anymore. It's, it's paralyzed on the ground. What's the instruction to the Sardis church? Strengthen what remains. There's still a pulse in there. There's still a little bit of breath in there. Strengthen what you've got left. Remember what church can be. And repent. There are, some, there are some preachers, their ministry is to go in and take over dead churches. They go to churches that have died. There are still some people that attend it. A couple of people show up on Sunday mornings. The church is dead. Some of them have been dead a long time. And these guys go in and they find, okay, what's left? What can we strengthen? Let's remember what church can be. Let's remember what church is supposed to be. Let's repent and take this thing that's ready to die and see if Jesus can breathe some life back into it. That's the instruction to that church. The overcomer in it, the message of the overcomer is, I'll give you white garments and you're kept in the book of life. You're not going to get blotted out of the book of life. Because guess what? Going to heaven is not based on where your church membership is. Now, I'm, I mentioned how thrilled I am to have the hackers as brand new members of the church. When they get to heaven, they are not going to say, guess what, God? We were members of Spokane Baptist Church. And God's going to say, oh, very impressive. <laughs> no. No. God's going to say, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no. No. I, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Like, you don't go to heaven based on your church membership. And so the overcomer, even in the dead church... The overcomer is still in the book of life. Praise the Lord. Okay. All right. We're coming, we're turning the corner a little bit. The Philadelphia church. The Philadelphia church. This is the beloved church. The beloved church. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I come quick. Verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Uh, I'm running out of time. I have to move fast. Philadelphian church. The strengths of this church, they worked through an open door. Jesus said, I set before thee an open door, and you worked through it. I gave you an opportunity, church, and you took it. Isn't that great? And the other thing he says is you kept my word. Do you want to be a church that does what Jesus says? The Philadelphian church took the opportunities God gave them, and they kept his word. They did what he said. That's pretty good. What were the failures of this church? None. Gee, I mean, obviously the Philadelphian church had problems again. But Jesus says, you took the opportunities I gave you. You did what I said. Gold star. This is the church that Jesus says, I will show the world that you are my beloved church to Philadelphia. What's the instruction to them? The instruction is hold fast. The end is coming. Now, Instead of the end is coming to the church, like he's threatening Pergamos and Thyatira with, this church, he says, actually the end is coming. Verse 11, behold, I come quickly. We're going to make some note of that in a moment. The overcomer in the Philadelphian church says he'll be made a pillar in the temple of God. I just want to say that when I think about the heroes of my faith, when I think about like the pillars of our faith as Christians, they were members mostly of Philadelphian and Smyrna churches because they were the ones that translated the Bible into new languages. They were the ones that took the gospel to new countries, that took it to new people groups, that built new orphanages, that, that went to places that nobody else was going, that reached people nobody else was going. They were the people that saw an open door from God and ran through it, right? Those are the pillars. Okay. And finally, we end on a little bit of a sour note the Laodicean church. Maybe you've heard of the Laodicean church. If you've been around Christianity for a while, you've probably heard this term. This is the lukewarm church. It is not a compliment. The lukewarm church at Laodicea, verse 14. Actually, look at verse 15 this morning. Chapter 3, verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. This church, Jesus says, it makes me want to puke. He says, cold water, good. Hot water, 
coffee. It's a paraphrase. Lukewarm? Yuck. Jesus says, you know, if you were just cold and dead, then we could try to do CPR. If you were alive, that'd be great. But you're just sort of meh. And it's worse than that. Look at the next verse. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This church, it's not just that they're meh. They think they're awesome. We are rich. We got it all under control. We are, we are the model church. And Jesus says, you're a wretched church. You're not richly clothed. You're naked. You're not leaders. You're blind. They don't even know how badly off they are. They're the opposite of the Smyrna church. The Smyrna church is persecuted and oppressed, but spiritually rich. This church, kings of the world and spiritually destitute. What are the strengths of this church? Weirdly, nothing mentioned. Nothing. I mean, Jesus found something nice to say about the Sardis church. But nothing for Laodicea. Why? Does this church have no strengths? They must have something. They got a candlestick. Why does Jesus not say anything nice to them? Because they're so full of themselves already. They already think they're awesome. Guess what? If you're that, if you're that convinced that you're awesome, don't expect compliments from Jesus. What are their weaknesses? What are their failures? They're lukewarm. They believe they're rich when they're actually terribly poor. They're deceived. They're terribly poor. The instruction is be zealous. One way to translate the word zealous here is actually boiling. Jesus says, get hot. Quit being lukewarm. Heat up. Do something. And come back to me for the true riches. Quit trying to be rich without me. Come back to me for the true riches. The overcomer and the Laodicean church, God says, I'll fellowship with you. Oh yeah, God will fellowship with you if you invite him in. This is the famous, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. That's the Laodicean church. Jesus says, I'm willing to come in. What a tragic thing that Jesus is outside this church saying, hey, can I come in? Then the overcomer will sit with Christ in his throne. The real position of honor. Hear me now, church. The real position of honor is not to have a nice church. It's not to have a comfortable life. The real position of honor is to sit with Christ. That's it. Okay. All these churches exist today. Today. So those seven churches all existed right there in Turkey. They were all there. You could, you could drive in a day to all seven locations. They're all there. They're all real churches that really existed. They all still exist today. They also exist today. You find those hardworking churches that have, are starting to lose their love. You can find those Ephesian churches. You can find the Smyrna churches. We talked about it like in Pakistan and China. Find those Smyrna churches. Lots of them around the world today. Pergamos, you find those worldly churches that are cozying up to the world, trying to get accepted by the world, bringing those worldly things and toleration of immorality and idolatry into the church. There are a lot of Pergamos churches in America today. Thyatira, Sardis, the corrupt and the dead churches. That was one of the heartbreaking things in Europe was to go around and see these monster, beautiful buildings, empty, nobody in them, not doing anything, dead. You can find the Philadelphia churches that take those opportunities that God gives them and work. We are trying to be a Philadelphia church here. When I see the way this church reacts to missionaries and the way that you sacrificially give and the way we're supporting the gospel going around, the way this church reacts to vacation Bible school and stuff, I got to tell you, that's Philadelphian kind of behavior. Amen. There's the open door. Let's go get it. The Laodicean churches, increasingly common in America, just lukewarm. All right. So I want to make some application here. Ooh. Oh, no. All right. 
Those of you that are tired and hungry, blame the people that are shouting at the preacher to preach. All right. What we're going to do, and, 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 I'll, and I'll move quickly, we're going to talk about the sign, the warning, and the therefore. That's the application here this morning. The sign, the warning, and therefore. I'll remind you from last week, the sign is cloudier. It's not as clear, right? But I'm going to tell you what I think it is. The warning, much clearer. We've got to pay attention to this Christian. The therefore, what ought we to do? Okay, we're going to end our message by looking at these things this morning. The sign's a little bit intense this morning. We might have to circle back later and cover some more of this, but we'll get, we'll get the high points. The sign here is that the church age is going to end. Now, that's not a maybe immediately obvious to you as you read these, as we look at these seven churches, we say, well, why do we think the church age is going to end? But there's a couple of clues in this passage that leads me to believe that that's true. The first one is, is this. The word church in Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3, the word church is used 18 times. 18 times the first three chapters of Revelation, the Bible talks about church or churches. You want to guess how many times in the next 20 verse chapters? Zero. The last mention of church is in chapter 3, and throughout the rest of Revelation, it does not show up again. In chapter 22, the very end says, you and the churches listen to what God has said. And that's the end of it. But that's, so other than that, at the end of chapter 22, that's it. No more mention of church. So that's interesting. The other interesting thing we see in these chapters is that Jesus has said the versions of this a few times now. When he's speaking to the church, he says, hold fast till I come. What's that imply? Jesus is coming. Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. Now he says that then to the Philadelphian church. Behold, I come quickly. And then to the Laodicean church, he says, behold, I stand at the door. So as we read through these churches, Jesus starts out saying by hold fast till I come. By the time you get to the sixth church, Philadelphia, he says, behold, I come quickly. And by the time you get to the seventh church, he says, behold, I stand at the door. Do you notice a progression in that? Um, this is what I believe, and I believe that, and, and I'll try to show you some of this in the scriptures this morning, but we're going to, have to do it quickly, is that we, when we think of the Old Testament, we think primarily God of dealing with the nation of Israel, right? Starting with Abraham, right, through to Jesus, God is mostly dealing with the nation of Israel. That's the Old Testament. We can call that the age of Israel. It ends when the Messiah, when Jesus Christ came. He came, he died on a cross, he said to his followers, I'm starting my church, Right? And unto Peter, on this rock, I'll build my church. The, the, not Peter, but on his proclamation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Right? So that starts the church age. That church age is going to end. See that little arrow pointing up there? Right? Because Jesus says, behold, I come. Right? So that's the end of it. But in between that, this, now this is not clear in the text. Christians only started noticing this about 200 years ago. 200 years ago, Christians started noticing that the order in which these seven churches are addressed follows broadly the history of the church in the world. It's really, really cool. I, I have to do this quickly with you this morning. When we think about the history of the church, the first, so the first 70 years or so, so from Christ's ascension, he goes into the heavens, and the apostles begin to carry out. They start at Jerusalem, Pentecost, and move out. 30 to 100 AD, we call that the apostolic church age. Right? So the apostles are still alive. I mean, they're martyred throughout this period. Um, so the apostles are still alive, preaching the gospel. This was an enormously hardworking church. I mean, they got the gospel. They, they survived all the persecution. They got the gospel out all over the world. As you read about it, though, you read the book of Acts, and you see what's going on in the book of Acts, you'll see that it sounds a lot like the Ephesus church. It's this really hardworking church. But, they, but even Peter starts to kind of get more wrapped up in the doing of things than, than the loving and has to be admonished by Paul and kind of get put back on track. It's really very interesting. Then after all the apostles are gone, after John dies in exile on Patmos, what happens after that, and, the, and from 100 AD to 312 AD, global persecution. Now the church was persecuted to start with, right? The persecution of Jerusalem, terrible. The persecution that fell on certain locations, certain churches got terribly persecuted. But until 100 AD, it was mostly in cities. Starting in 100 AD, the Roman Empire undertook a campaign to stomp out the Christian church. Right? It was no longer just persecution from just cities, but the whole empire tried to snuff it out. 
That meant in Africa. That meant in Asia. That meant in Europe. Everywhere the Roman Empire had sway, they tried to stomp out the church, right? Terrible. Using Christians as torches to light the gardens and feeding them the lions. All that's in this period. What's that sound like? Like the Smyrna church. The most common church in the world at that time would have been Smyrna-type churches. Then in 312 AD, something really interesting happened. The Roman Emperor Constantine supposedly converted to Christianity. Now, he did not. It was a political move, right? You, Constantine did not. <laughs> okay. I mean, the Lord knows, but okay. But what, D, what he did do is he made, he made Christianity legal. And then what happened in this period from 312 when Christianity became legal through to 600 AD is that the churches started bringing in some idolatry into the church. Some of those Roman, those immoral Roman practices started coming into the church. Some of that worldliness started invading the church and pastors started getting politically powerful. They started building, instead of just a pastor being in charge of a church, after 312, all of a sudden you have pastors in charge of multiple churches. All of a sudden people are making money off the gospel. What's that sound like? Sounds like the Pergamos church, the worldly church. And that's what followed after that period of intense persecution in Smyrna. The next up in church history was the Pergamos thing, where all of a sudden now the most common type of church in the world are these Pergamos churches, these worldly churches. That goes through to 600 AD. In 600 AD, um, that's a little bit of an arbitrary date. But what happens, what starts happening in 600 AD is you start getting the first pope. You get the worship of saints. You get, they start to do things like sell indulgences to get people out of hell and into heaven. You start getting, it was during this period that some churches decided that it was a sin for the common person to read the Bible themselves. All that stuff starts to develop then through the 615, 17 AD, what we often refer to that period as the Dark Ages, right? What church does that sound like? Thyatira, like the corrupted church, right? And so there goes the Thyatira. In 1517, what happened? That's the Protestant Reformation, right? It's Martin Luther. He says, okay, the church has gotten so corrupted. He says, we got to get out, right? It's interesting uh, but then through that period, so they get out the Protestants, it's good news. The, they leave the church and Martin Luther, praise God, good stuff. But the Protestants get out, they start setting up their own churches, they start killing the Catholics. And the Catholics were there in power, they're killing the Protestants. Both sides killing the Baptists. Some people think that Baptists are Protestants, not so. Baptists have been around forever. At this point in history, we were called Anabaptists. Do you know that Martin Luther married an Anabaptist woman before the Protestant Reformation happened? She was an influence. Part, part of the reason that... Okay, anyway, I'm just kidding. Ah. <laughs> but this church, it's not spreading the gospel around the world. It's not trying to reach into new places. It's too busy fighting, fighting with other Christians, fighting amongst themselves. It's awful. What is it? It's the Sardis church. It's powerless. There's, there's bits of life in there, right? Thank God for Martin Luther and John Huss. I mean, during this period, the Bible gets translated into English. The Bible gets translated into the common languages. It starts to get printed on the printing presses. I mean, there's good stuff that happens. There's bits of life in there, but mostly it's an ugly, ugly period of church history. What happens in 1730? The Great Awakening. The Great Awakening happens in England. People remember they repent. They go back to God. The Great Awakening sweeps through Europe. It comes over to America. Did you know there would be no United States of America if not for the first Great Awakening? They used to teach that in schools. They don't anymore. You're welcome. It laid, it laid the foundation for that. There's the rediscovery of that God treats us as individuals and, and the whole Baptist experiment here and separation of church and state and all that stuff. You can draw the roots out of that right out of the Great Awakening. It spreads into Africa and into South America. You get the second Great Awakening that started here in the U.S. Then you get the global outreach to missions. At this point, thanks to the British Empire and the churches that sprang up there from the Great Awakening, the gospel goes to India and the gospel goes to Australia and the gospel goes to China and it goes to the Philippine Islands and it begins to spread around the world. What church does that sound like? I'm telling you, that's the Philadelphia church. A big open door and they went through it. God loved that church. 
There are still churches like that. To that church, Jesus said, behold, I come quickly. We're getting near the end now. What, what's the next church that's mentioned? In the 1900s to today, what happened in the 1900s is we got the rise of something called modernism. It started in Germany. It's the idea that you really shouldn't take the Bible literally. Y'all are taking the Bible way too seriously. It doesn't really mean all that stuff. All that really gets cranked up in the universities in Europe in the 1900s, spreads like a cancer out of there. Where there, there are still churches, there are still Christians, kind of, but they're puke kind of churches. <laughs> it's the Laodicea, it's the lukewarm church. To that church, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. The end is almost here. So, you kind of, isn't that... Is that fascinating to anybody else besides me? Again, this was not obvious until really just a couple hundred years ago when people started noticing, you know, the way that Jesus addressed these seven churches in order looks a lot like the history of the church, sort of prophetically encoded in the Bible. Isn't that? You said, keep preaching, preacher. This is good stuff. Okay. So what's it end with? What's Jesus saying? When he says, behold, I come quickly, behold, I stand at the door. What's he talking about? He's talking about the rapture. Uh, I believe the rapture, what is that? Titus 2.13, we are looking for, the church is looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now here's the thing, church, and I want you to get this if you can. We are not looking for the Antichrist to show up. Some Christians are very busy, who's the Antichrist? They're looking for who the Antichrist is going to be. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We are looking for Jesus Christ. Our hope is that Jesus is going to show up. And the church, that's been the blessed hope of the church since Jesus went into the clouds. The Christians have been waiting for this. This is the hope of the church. But it's specifically, it's the rapture. So what is it? The rapture, it comes from 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. In, in the Greek, it's hepadso. But in the Latin, that's raptura. That's where the word rapture comes from. It's, it's the catching up, the raptura, the catching up. We shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. When Jesus comes, we're going to go up into the clouds and meet him in the air. That's the rapture. If you're afraid of heights, don't worry. In another place, the Bible says it happens in the twinkling of an eye. It will be too fast for you to get afraid of heights. All right. But, but, that's, but that's where the meeting is, with Jesus in the air, right? So when is it? When do we go meet Jesus in the air? This gets a little bit... Now, broadly, any Christian that believes the Bible believes all that that I just told you. That's not very controversial. We're looking for Jesus. We're going to go meet him in the sky. Jesus said that. Lots of Bible verses say that. That's a pretty clear Bible teaching. When is it you start to get some disagreement? But I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> no. No. To the best of my ability, I'm going to tell you what I think. Understand that this is clouded, but let me, let me tell you when I think it happens. I think, here we have the church age coming across, after the, after the coming of Christ. I believe that the rapture is not the second coming. The rapture, we go to meet Jesus. See, that red line is Jesus. I know it doesn't look like him, but that's... So there, the cross, he comes the first time. The rapture, we meet him in the air. But the second coming is seven years or slightly more, after the rapture, okay? Now, you might say, well, why do you, why the gap? And I'll, I'll give you a couple of reasons. First of all, well, actually, before I do that, I know you all want to write that down. Before I do that, let me say this. Um, in the rapture, you just saw the verse. We go to meet Jesus in the sky. In the second coming, the Bible says that Jesus is going to set his foot on the Mount of Olives and that it's going to split in two. Okay, it's a dramatic thing. You can go read about it in Zechariah. Okay? So when I read that, I think Jesus in the sky, Jesus on the Mount of Olives, that's two different events. Right? Those are two separate things that happen. So the order that they happen in, we, we can figure out. But the rapture is different than the second coming. Okay. Um, also, I would say this. The second coming is preceded by a lot of signs. Before, before Jesus sets his foot on the Mount of Olives, there has to be the abomination of desolations in the temple. That means the temple's got to get rebuilt. There has to be the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, signs in the heavens, right? A third of the river's poisoned. 
right? A third of the ships in the sea destroyed. All this stuff has to happen before, there's all these signs before the second coming. But for the rapture to meet Jesus, the Bible says, be ready. Be ready. Jesus could come at any time. Be ready for Jesus to come back. You don't know when he's coming. If that's true, it has to be before all of those signs of the second coming. Does that, does that sort of make sense? Okay. I want to give you three other reasons why I believe that the rapture is first and it could happen at any moment. Uh, the first one is, so, the, so I'm going to tell you, the rapture occurs before the Antichrist is revealed. I know it is a fun guessing game <laughs> of who's the Antichrist, but he's not, the Bible says he's not revealed until after the rapture happens. Let me show you that. Second, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he that now letteth, which in, in King James, to let is to restrain. I know that's confusing. But to let is it's to hold back. He that letteth, he that holds back, will let until he's taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed. You see that? So the restrainer, which is pretty clearly the Holy Spirit, is restraining the arrival of the Antichrist. But once the Holy Spirit is removed, then the Antichrist is going to appear. Now, if there's no Holy Spirit, there's no church. You cannot have a church without the Holy Spirit. And if you don't believe that, go look at Romans 8 and Ephesians 1. And there's a bunch of other ones, but those ought to do it for you. Okay. Secondly, part of our salvation is being saved from God's wrath. Now, there are many, we are saved out of trials. We are saved out of trouble, but we are saved from wrath. Do you, do you catch the distinction there? We have trouble, but God saves us out of it. We have trials, but God saves us out of it. But we are saved from wrath. And that's an important thing, and it's, an, and it's a wonderful thing. Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. In the very scary chapters we're about to get to, next Sunday, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. <laughs> The wrath of God is literally poured out onto the earth. And so I would suggest to you this morning, Christians cannot be here for that because we're saved from the wrath. All right. And then thirdly, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Thirdly, Satan gets victory over the saints in the tribulation. Remember I told you that there's no mention of church after Revelation chapter 3? That's true. What happens is that the terminology switches. And in Revelation, the term that's used for the people of God is saint. All of a sudden, there's no more church. Now it's just saints. And the saints did this, and the saints do that, and the saints praise the Lord. And Revelation 13, 7, it was given to him, the Antichrist and the devil, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. During the tribulation, the, the devil and the Antichrist, his henchmen, are going to make war on the saints, and they're going to win which would tell you right away that can't, those saints cannot be the church. Because you know what Jesus said to his church? Look at what Jesus said. Or, I mean, this is in First John, but in any case, First John 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So if it's, if it's the devil versus Jesus, who wins? Jesus wins. Come on, church. Jesus wins, right? And so, listen, if you are a Christian, what's the Bible say? You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Jesus lives inside of you, right? So if it's the devil versus you, who wins? Jesus that's in you. So in the tribulation, when the devil overcomes the saints, what's that tell you? They don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them. Now, they're saints, they're followers of God, but they're not part of the church. They don't have the Holy Spirit. Listen, some people think, well, I'll just get saved when all this stuff starts happening. Boy, that's a bad, bad mistake. It's a super bad idea. 
Because right now you get saved, you follow God, you get the Holy Spirit, you get joy and peace and fellowship with God and rescued before everything hits the fan. <laughs> okay. All right. Here's the conclusion of the sermon this morning. The warning. Here's the warning. And this, you don't, you believe differently than I do about the rapture. That's okay. I still love you. But, but the warning of the scriptures is clear, regardless of what you think about this, and it's this. Jesus could come at any time. Jesus could come at any time. I want to show you just one verse of that this morning. It's in Mark chapter 13, directly from the mouth of our Savior. This is what Jesus said. But at that day and that hour, speaking about his return, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Jesus says, I don't even know the exact day or hour. Jesus said, I don't even know. Now, don't hurt yourself, but okay. Jesus said this, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taken a far journey. And you can read on there. We don't have time for it this morning, but Jesus says, I left, I left my servants in charge, and I gave them things to do, and then when I'm going to come back, and then he says, watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh. He says, so when I come back, be doing what I told you to do. Be busy, because you don't know when I'm coming back. He says, and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Is that clear enough, Christian? The warning is that Jesus could come back any time. It ought to motivate, it ought to affect the way that we live, our expectation that Jesus could be here at any time. So here's the therefore, and we're done. Therefore, be an overcomer. Therefore, be an overcomer. Heed Christ's instructions to your church. I told you this morning that I really want to be a Philadelphian church. Sometimes I worry that I personally am more of an Ephesian. <laughs> and so I take those warnings seriously. I see a lot of Philadelphian aspects of this church. It's one of the reasons I love to be a part of this church. I love to come here. The brotherly love that's here, the love for missions that's here, the love for kids and the gospel. You're all willingness to take advantage of open doors and work through it. That's awesome. But listen, if you agree like I do that this is a Philadelphian church, you still got to be an overcomer. Jesus wants to know what you're going to do. Maybe you're here this morning and you think, you know, I think it's a little bit of a Pergamos church. Don't tell me that'll hurt my feelings. <laughs> but listen, if, you, if you're just like, listen, it's dark out there. This is the best I could do. This church is the best I could do, but I see these problems. I think it's kind of a Pergamos church. Listen, if that's you, you go read what Jesus said to the Pergamos church. You go read what Jesus said to the people, the overcomers in that Pergamos church, and you do what Jesus said. Don't just blame Spokane Baptist Church for your problems. Don't just blame Pastor Josh for your problems. Now listen, I don't want to cause you problems. You say, man, if that preacher would just have gotten done on time, I could have gone and served God. <laughs> Whatever it is, you be an overcomer. Revelation twenty two twelve. here's what it says. Behold, Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give to every man, it's individual, according as his work shall be. Jesus is going to treat you just like you. Jesus knows your burdens. He knows your brokenness. He's not going to judge you according to me or some other church or anybody else. It's just you as an individual. All right, if every head bow and eye closed, Sister Nancy, you're able to come and just play quietly. I want to give you a moment to just do a little business with God before we're dismissed into lunch. Some of you got a jet, I understand that. But, but if possible, but if possible, can I, can I ask you right now to just take a moment before we're done and, and do some business with the Lord. I, I know it's like maybe trying to drink out of a fire hose this morning. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But I genuinely believe that God wanted to say something to you personally today. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. But if you would, would you take a moment to talk to God? Maybe God is speaking to you about being ready for his return. The most important way to be ready 
is to make sure that you know you're saved, that all of your sins have all been forgiven. Is God speaking to you about knowing him? Are you sure that you're right with God? Jesus is coming back and he's coming to judge the world in righteousness. Are you ready for that day? Are you ready to stand in front of God? If you're not 100% sure, if you're not 100% sure, you can be. Would you let us take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure? We won't show you just our opinion or the Baptist opinion. We'll show you what the Bible says about how you can be sure that all your sins have been taken care of. Maybe God wants you to be ready for his return in some other way. You, you know you're saved. You know your home's in heaven. But maybe this morning you'd say, you know, pastor, if I really truly believe that Jesus could come back any day, something would be different in my life. You'd talk differently. You'd stop putting something off. You'd start doing X and stop doing Y. So, you know, if I really thought he could come tomorrow, if I really believed that, that tomorrow could be it, there's some things in my life I'd do different. Maybe you could talk to God about being ready, about watching, expecting that he could come. Maybe God's speaking to you about being an overcomer. And you know what that thing is. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a weakness here in, in our church. Maybe it's a weakness uh, in, in your own life. And God would speak to your heart about being an overcomer. It's not how you get to heaven, but that is how you get the real joy and the real blessings of walking with Jesus. The more overcomers you have in a church, the more likely it is to be a Philadelphia church, the more likely it is to be a Smyrna church. It can make a difference. You can make a difference. You want this church to be better? Me too. You want it to be more like Jesus? Me too. But that happens when individuals in that church decide to be overcomers. Take seriously what Jesus is saying to the churches. What's God calling you to do? You take a moment and do some business with the Lord, and then we'll sing and be dismissed. But first, just you and just God.